everybody. This is the Nitty Gritty. My name is Chad. With me is Leonard. This is a show about wrestling, and I am coming to you from a different location in my house. We're having issues in our basement, Leonard, so I'm in my son's room right now, um, which probably needs to be cleaned, but I did manage to just prop a WrestleMania five poster there. I see that. Is he also a Jesse and the Rippers fan? Well, yeah, his name is Jesse, so... <laughs> we, we put the Jesse and the Rippers up uh, at one point because his middle name is Lincoln. We had a poster of the movie Lincoln back here, but Stephanie, uh, my wife, uh, got annoyed by that being there. So we took that down. <laughs> yeah, as this, your last name is Webb, you should get like a Spider-Man poster. Right. That would make sense, too. And we have the pink bunny from Full House. Um, for yeah, I can't, yeah, I can't quite see that the way the light's hitting it. It's just... So anyway, here I am today. Um, we are going to be bringing you another one of our super reviews, which we haven't done in a while, where basically we take an episode of a promotion slash territory and we review it. Um, so the territory that we are going, or company we're going to be talking about today is Texas All-Star Wrestling. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason we are going over this um, is because I kind of went down a little bit of a rabbit hole after we reviewed the match between Shawn Michaels and Venom from 2000 when Shawn Michaels was uh, injured away from WWE. Um, they had a match, and the history of that feud was that Venom being Paul Diamond, they were once in a tag team called American Force that was in Texas All-Star Wrestling. So I decided to look up and see if there were episodes of Texas All-Star Wrestling on YouTube and there are, so that's why we decided, decided to start with this one. Uh, uh, I, I wonder, so you didn't tell me where it came from, but I figured it was because we had done the Michaels diamond match. Yeah, and that's, so that's, I kind of decided like, well, let's see a little bit what this is about. So we should go over a little bit of the background. So Texas All-Star Wrestling, this is not to be confused with the promotion that, as far as I know, is still going, that was founded in 1984 in conjunction with Booker T's school. Um, it's also called Texas All-Star Wrestling. Um, that is not what this one is. Uh, this one is from the 70s and 80s um, and was part what of was the, What was the year of Booker T's? 94 it got started 94 i thought you said 84 it's like that's way too early for him but yeah. i do know that he started the school early on yeah 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 and uh so when you look up texas all-star wrestling in the wikipedia page it will show you booker t's uh booker t and uh the person who runs that company now um so this is different this was uh you know associated with the nwa and so this takes place this episode takes place november 9th 1985 now in 1985 the texas area territory was really you know kind of in shambles um you had you know vince was moving wwf national and he was you know buying up tv time or not buying it well yeah i guess he was buying it initially yeah buying tv time and so he was he was spreading wwf all over the place um WCCW was not what it once was. Um, and what you also had was a, I guess it was an outlaw promotion called Southwest Championship Wrestling, which was owned by Joe Blanchard. Um, that went from 1978 to 1985 and was eventually purchased by Texas All-Star Wrestling, whose owner, I believe, how you say his name is Fred Barrand, um, and from what I read, he possibly is in prison for a, uh, a murder for hire thing. No, oh, nice. No, I didn't. I, I have heard of the name. I do not know a lot about him. Right. So, you know, look for that dark side of the ring episode, maybe in next season or two. Um, yeah, they're working out the stories. Eventually they're going to have to hit everything. So. I know. And so finding information about Texas all-star wrestling is tricky because everything that comes up is the promotion that is still going. So trying to find out where the Texas All-Star Wrestling started, it just kind of brings me to Southwest Championship Wrestling, which was Joe Blanchard's uh, outlaw territory. Um, so that's a little bit of the background of what Texas was at the time. It was kind of falling apart 
in the last half of the 1980s, Texas All-Star Wrestling would eventually be named USA All-Star Wrestling. Um, and it was, uh, you know, they would run shows like, you know, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, Eastern Texas, you know, but eventually WWF was just kind of coming in and steamrolling. And uh, there were issues with Baron and, you know, potential em embezzlement and, you know, they had all this kind of stuff, but uh, it just, it just died out. But there was number of stars that would appear in Texas All-Star Wrestling, which is why we're going to be talking about it. So let's get started with this episode. And like I said, it took place November 9th, 1985. And, you know, what it seems like, Leonard, and it, it is, this is like a full episode of the show, but like a, some other segments are added in. Yeah, it gets confusing at the end because it seems that we're seeing some bits that they kind of previewed or... It's it's yeah. from the next week, so yeah. The so the last I think it's two two segments or so get get kind of confusing as to where everything fits. Right. Yeah. And so this starts with a promo from Chavo Guerrero, uh, not the Chavo Guerrero that we see on senior Chavo Classic. Chavo, yes, thank you, Chavo Classic, and uh, he's doing a promo about Al Madrill and. Uh, you know, Big Bubba as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Leonard, do you want to tell everybody who Big Bubba is? Big Bubba is with him, and it is not Big Bubba Rogers, a.k.a. the Big Boss Band. No, it right. is uh, the Shockmaster, yes. uh, uh, Fred Ottman, Tugboat Thomas, however name you want to give him. I was going to say, if you had said ty Tugboat or Typhoon first, I would have mm -hmm. corrected you and said, no, 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 this is the Shockmaster. The Shockmaster. But you went Shockmaster first, which is... Uh, yes, I, I had to look it up when I was watching it because I knew it, was, I knew it wasn't I uh, knew Boss Man, and, I, and right. I had to look it up. And then after I saw it was Fred Ottman, I it was like, oh, yeah, that does that does look like Fred Ottman if you really look yeah. at it. Yeah, initially, yeah, I saw the name, and, you know, I looked at him, and I was like, that's too big for Ray Trailer, you know? Yeah. And I was like, who is that? And uh, I did not know that he had a name so close to Big Bubba Rogers once in his career, uh, Fred Ottman. Mm -hmm. And this would have been before Big Bubba Rogers, because because I don't think he debuted right. until 80, 87? Yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. And he was working as a, um, a bodyguard for Jim Cornette and JCP. So I think it was 87-ish. 80, right. Um, so yeah, this this promo uh, gets us started, and then it shifts to a promo from Al Madrill, which uh, I felt was a little bit too long, Leonard. Uh, it was a little long, but I actually I liked it. I, I I knew of Al Madrill, right, and I knew that he had a long association with Chavo Classic. Uh, right. That they had been tag partners, they had feuded. Um, I thought this was was a, a pretty good promo. I do admit to you uh, that it is a little long. Um, he. Uh, talks uh about um you know that he's that he's he, he's been talking to bobby heenan with the wwf which i highly doubt that is true um he hypes gary hart coming in uh from world class and joining with him and they offer five thousand dollars anyone who can last in the ring with the russian that gary hart is bringing in so that's just a classic angle the you know we're putting up so much money if anyone can last 10 minutes or anyone can beat the certain guy. So, so very classic angle here without Madrill. And I'll mention this cause you can hear it a little bit and you hear it throughout. There are two commentators. One is speaking English and the other is speaking Spanish and, and the, the Spanish feed seems down. So my guess is they recorded two different audio feeds right. and depending on which, station you were at because my guess is there were mexican stations that were getting this um uh program so they would dial up the others because what we're watching the spanish language feed is very is very low you can hear it but it's not the main english feed and also al madrill uh does uh, uh speak in spanish a little bit to, right. to the crowd as well and chavo does that too some of the guys who are bilingual will will i don't know if they're exactly repeating themselves or saying something else in spanish so you do get some spanish language uh off the bilingual guys as well in this yeah and you like you know amadrill is like there's two guys holding microphones yeah in this face, uh, which makes for an interesting look you know um 
these days it's you know usually just a female or whatever backstage but um so and they're sitting in the ring apron too which you usually don't see that anymore like the ringside interview right yeah that's true yeah you don't that's yeah you don't really see that as much these days um mm -hmm. so yeah like i said initially i got into this because of the paul diamond Shawn michaels tag team and imagine my surprise when i see some of the names on this promotion at the time so the next match we have is toshiaki kawada and samson fiyuki versus jim powell and nick kaniski uh nick kaniski being the son of gene kaniski mm -hmm. now uh kawada for those into japanese wrestling know that he's you know one of the famed four pillars of japanese wrestling and, you know, he's a five-time Triple Crown heavyweight champion, nine-time world tag team champion, uh, three-time winner of the real world tag team, real world tag league, and uh, and so on and so forth. He's had many classic matches, but this was extremely early in his career um, to the point where, like, he, after he made his debut in 1982, he was sent to North America for a year to tour and gain experience uh from november 1985 or so on mm -hmm. and uh he and he did that with a lot of guys antonio Inoki toured um the u.s at one point i remember uh they talked about in the cornet show i think it was one of their guest the cards because it was the name that Inoki used in the u.s and i don't remember what that was but that was a dead giveaway because he was only in the u.s for a certain period of time that seemed to be something common that the japanese promotions would do would be to send uh their guys to the u.s for a year or so to tour the territories and get some some different experience right and uh you know he would appear in Stu Hart's stampede wrestling um it, frank valois international wrestling and of course texas all-star wrestling and um, he doesn't speak about his time in North America very much because apparently he did not like it. <laughs> um, Fair enough. So, you know, so here they here you are, like you have these two guys, and I, you know, I like I said, I was very surprised uh, to see their names on here. And unfortunately, like once they went back to Japan, their tag team name Leonard would be Footloose. And Footloose. It, it should have been that here, but I guess they hadn't gotten there quite yet. No, that would that would have been uh, great. Because they use they use their feet a lot, a lot of a lot of kick. That was always the big thing, especially in the '80s with the Asian wrestlers, is that they would they would kick, they would use their feet, which was crazy to us here in in America at the time. Yeah, uh, Kawada specifically had a, had a signature type of kicking. Um, so yeah, this match was uh, not super long you know he had some submission stuff going on here and you know it it was what it was what do you have notes about this one uh you know it, it was just a spot to get the foreign heels over the, the thing that kind of i thought was really odd was the boston crab spot because instead of pulling on the guy for leverage his partner just sort of like pushed him and pushed him out of it right, right. So, so, so i thought that was weird other than that um and the leg drop off the top rope and again, I don't know which guy is which guy, where the other guy was holding him. I think that should have been uh, the finish. So, so yeah, this is kind of just a standard squash to get the uh, foreign heels over. But I fine for what it was. Right. Um, so after this, we have a somewhat of a promo with American Force, Shawn Michaels and Paul Diamond. And they show highlights of their match with the Hoods. And, you know, this was an extremely young Shawn Michaels. So basically what I wrote down here was that he seemed, promo-wise, he seemed a little bit um, unsure of himself. Um, the match with, with the Hoods seemed, what the clips that we got seemed fine. Uh, the Hoods, by the way, are Ricky Santana and Tony Torres. And, you know, the camera work for that, those clips is not very good, uh, Leonard. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. And, yeah, Shawn Michaels, you could tell very green so what do you what do you have for this yeah i wrote that sean looks like he's about 12 here <laughs> yeah. and, and, and the um the, the the match that we get the clips of and we get clips of a couple other matches 
those are I'm guessing are from their their big you know weekly shows or wherever they were running. So that's like a hard cam thing, and that's why I, I'm guessing it doesn't look as good as the in studio stuff. Um, and and uh, the only other thing to mention I think would be that it, it, it gets hyped that they're going to have a rematch, and the hoods have to wear different color masks so they can't trade in and out. Yeah. And that is classic, classic angle right there. Yeah. You know, you you, you do that where they win via cheating by switching in and out twin magic as as we say for the bellas right. and then you have to do something to neutralize that so switching the hood colors um is good although although i wouldn't be surprised if in the rematch which we don't we don't see like if it was blue and red the blue guy had a red mask like in his trunks and he puts the red mask on over it like that wouldn't surprise me if they did if they did something like that yeah you know i thought it was interesting that, that it's like it's like, okay, you know, we'll have another match, but we are going to request this. And that's what they're like, you know, they don't request necessarily like, you know, steel cage, hard, you know, uh, no rules, you know, what, like, it's like, you have to wear a different color mask. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's how you, it's how you build. Right. And then so like I, said, build and build. I guarantee you the heels are going to win that rematch. They might, again, the one guy may have the other color mask and then, and then eventually it's probably going to go to like a lose. The losers have to unmask, or American right. Force has to leave the territory, or, right. or or something of that nature would would eventually come up um, um, with that. So yeah, so builds were just slower back then. Actually, I I look at my notes. American Force will leave the territory if they lose. Right. That's, so that they, was a part of it. They're putting that up against the mask. With that being the case, so so pardon me. With that being the case, there has to be a defensive winner. So unless it was known that Michaels and Diamond or one of the guys were going to be leaving the territory, um, then they would probably win here. But that would still could help lead to a bigger a bigger match in, in the future because this because then they would be one on one, and then you could get your cage match or your false count anywhere or your what have you from there. Right. But I would guess that American Force would win this unless they were playing to leave the territory. Yeah, and in this case, it might as well be a, uh, you know, loser kills the territory match because it wouldn't yeah. be much longer. Anyway, um, so, yeah, we have that. And the next segment is Mike Golden versus Al Gabigan. And, Leonard, what did you have note-wise on this? So, I, you know, because I, I will give my opinion here, but I'll let you go first. Okay, so so Golden is a blonde heel who wants to be Ric Flair. I don't think it's a bad look. I'm more interested in his ballet fantasy. Who, yeah. who I looked up, can't really find a lot about her. She gets drugged off by a guy early on, and and it's men- it's something is mentioned after like it's maybe Golden's a family like his brother or her or brother. a family member or something. Yeah, I and think they said it was her brother. Her brother. That's why it was. It was her brother. And I'm not sure who that guy was. I didn't get a good look at him. I'm not sure who it was. But what gets me is that his his valet, his girlfriend or whoever, gets drug off and he still wrestles the match. He does nothing. <laughs> he does nothing. He just lets her go. And then after the match, and this is a squash for him to put him over. I thought he looked fine. I'd be interested in seeing more Mike Golden. And he... Then goes off after, and they're trying to grab him and ask him what's going on. And that's when he's very quickly saying, "Oh, you know, it's her brother, and and it's a family matter, and blah blah blah." So I would be interested in knowing what happened. I was interested by the angle. I was interested by fantasy, um, but I thought, but it, it, it the, again, the match is fine, but it doesn't make any sense for him to wrestle the match after his woman has been kidnapped. Right, yeah, like there was like no reaction, and you know the notes I have. I was interested in fantasy as well. Um, I, I wrote that he, you know I couldn't find much info on Mike Golden. He seems to have the tools, but obviously he's a flare ripoff here. Yeah, I think he's. Which at this a- time, every promotion had a bleach yeah. blonde flare ripoff. Yeah, um, and yeah, was his name the Golden Boy? Didn't they were Golden Boy Mike Golden? I believe something like that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure. I think there are some other Goldens in wrestling, and I'm not sure 
if he was any connection to them, I can't think of those names off, off the top of my head right now. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, the match wasn't very long. Uh, you know, Mike Golden wins pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so the next match, we have a promo with Killer Tim Brooks and Al Madrill. Then you have a match with Killer Tim Brooks versus Rudy Boy Gonzalez. And uh, Leonard, why don't you go ahead? Brooks reminds me a bit of Dutch Mantel. Yeah. Um, I've never, I've heard of Killer Tim Brooks. Haven't really seen a lot of them. Uh, I thought he was okay. He looked okay in the ring. Um, I thought he had kind of a cool look. It, his promo wasn't bad. Uh, of course, you can tell that Al Madrill is the top heel in this promotion. Yeah. He comes back the second time here and he comes back later yet again. Um, so, you know, I, I thought this was, again, was fine for what it was. Um, you know, I think it gets Brooks's character over as this, this crazy brawler doesn't listen to anybody. Um, so again, if, all, I thought the promo work on this show overall was decent. The matches were serviceable for TV squashes. Did this match end in a DQ because Tim Brooks's tape fists were taped? I don't remember. I didn't make a note on that. I actually, I had watched this a while back from the time of us recording this, which we hadn't got to for a while. So I don't specifically remember. Yeah. That's the note that I had down, but okay. uh, the next segment you have Korcha Korchenko versus J.R. Hogg. It's a five minute challenge. Um, Fans get $5,000 if they can sit through uh, and survive a match with Korchenko for five minutes. Um, yeah, they. Uh, this is the 80s when they would do stuff like this, you know, a lot in, in terms of involving the fans. Uh, yes. But, yeah, obviously it doesn't last very long. So. No, and J.R. Hogg is a cross between a moon dog and Jimmy Valiant. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, this is just a squash to put the Russian over. This yeah. is, of course, the Russian that Al Madrill uh, was 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 touting earlier, and and Chavo talks about the Russian coming in in his promo from the open of the show as as well. So you know, and that's good. You know, they build the guy, and then you bring him out and you give him a quick squash, and it's a good way to kind of you know get a guy like that over. Yeah, and. Uh... Following this match, you have Nick Kins- Kaniski challenging Korchenko um, it, for this challenge, and I'm I'm sure mm-hmm. that I'm sure that Kin- um, Kaniski did not win, but uh, something to look for if we can find that other episode, right, Leonard? Yeah, so yeah, so we, we're gonna start doing weekly reviews of Texas All Star Wrestling from 1985. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Give us all the hits, all the algorithm. Right. Um, so our next segment is uh, highlights of a match Chavo Guerrero and Big Bubba versus Al Madrill and Killer Tim Brooks. Yeah, this is where things get confusing because because this kind of felt like the match they were hyping right. know, at the beginning of the show. Uh, but maybe this was the first match that these guys had and it led to the rematch. Uh, then yeah. why not start this with the segment that we're getting next? I don't know. Uh, this ends with a double ref bump and wild brawling to the back. Uh, I mean, I could see how triple, a there's a triple crowd... ref bump here. Oh, is that triple ref bump? Yeah, this is a missed one. But the dude, the ref gets wiped out. Like he gets the this referee gets a lot of punishment in this match. Um, yeah. By the way, Chavo introduces the highlights, and it it's from the believe the Freeman Coliseum is where the match is taking place. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, the ref initially gets thrown out by Chavo, and he isn't. No, there's no DQ, and that's the first one. Then there's a flying body press from Madrill that takes the referee out, <laughs> and then finally a fireball to the face. <laughs> so that's three different issues where the ref is like, you know, being handled. Um, tough night for that guy. I could see where a live crowd would eat this up, but like a home, like watching it. Say if you were watching it on pay per view which you weren't, but, but if it was like, you know, like something like that, you were watching it at home. I don't think you would be as, in, as enthused by it. I can see where a live crowd would eat, eat everything going on up. Right. And so the match has a lot of entertainment in it. So it's a lot of, it may be overbooked, but uh, you know, I remember 
like there's over the years people have had so many issues with fireballs this fireball seemed to go fine um but bruce pritchard on his podcast always talks about how you don't throw a fireball you present a fireball <laughs> yes so um so yeah this one it didn't seem like they had any issues getting it off um mm-hmm. but did you have any opinion on match quality itself no, you know, I, I think it was a, a, a good brawl. A lot of what we're talking about is is setting up the next thing. So this very much felt like we're going to do this crazy entertainment, wrestling entertainment type match with all these ref bumps and the fireball and the brawling off to set up the next thing. So, and again, this is the one of the other ones where it's the highlights from out in the arena. So the video quality isn't fantastic. But, um, you know, you, you, you get it. So one thing I will say is they're all about setting up their stories. Yeah. But they seem to be doing that well. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. No, I agree. I mean, this is just kind of a, this is ba- I mean, all in all, it's a basic regular episode of a wrestling show. Uh, yes. From back then that they're trying to build. Uh, stuff. Yeah. Trying to build the house shows, trying to build the big monthly show or big weekly show, um, carrying matches over, carrying storylines over making sure each one's bigger than the one before, you know, standard, very standard practices. Right. Um, the next segment we have the assassin and Dale VC versus Scott Casey and Chavo Guerrero. Um, Dale VC, um, for those who don't know, um, he also went by the name Lieutenant James Earl Wright. He mm-hmm. was in the tag team state patrol with Buddy Lee Parker in the 1990s. And I only know VC from that before this, but I was surprised here. I was very impressed with VC. I thought he was buff. Uh, he had a good look going on. He's, I forget which belt he had, but he was a champion of something. Um, I was pretty impressed with him overall in this match. He looked a lot better than, than his partner did. And I think he got more in on Casey and Guerrero than his partner did. Um, I'd also like to mention that Al Madrill sits in on commentary and my favorite line is, is that Madrill is going to contact his lawyer about the promoter because nobody should pay just three dollars to see Al Madrill because they were doing some sort of special three dollar general seats for the next show or something. So I love that line. That's classic heel right there. I'm going to sue you because people should pay more to see me. That's <laughs> fantastic. But, but this is probably the best match of the night, I would say for me, yeah. and a lot of that had to do with with Del Vizi actually, you know, getting a little bit and not being necessarily squashed by uh, the faces. And, of course, Guerrero and Casey are, you know, veterans and, and decent hands in the ring. Yeah, no, I, I agree. This was, this was definitely, like, if there's a best match of this card, then it, this would be it. Um, and for those who don't know, Scott Casey um, would, you know, when he retired, he would start a school, and he's one of the people that broke Booker T into the business. Um, so that's that's his claim to fame. And we would also have Casey announced as the referee for one of the upcoming tag matches. Um, I believe it's maybe the one with Madrill and Tim Brooks. That would make sense. I didn't make a note of that. But yeah, that's probably what it was. And so the final segment um, would be a promo with um, Shawn Michaels and Paul Diamond of American Force um, talking about an upcoming match they're going to have with Kawada and Fuyuki, who is managed by Gary Hart. So then you see Gary Hart, um, you know, doing a promo for those guys who probably didn't speak a lick of English. Um, That would be a match that would happen on November 16th since we're on November 9th. I went out of my way to see if I could find that tag match Mm -hmm. because nothing would have been cooler to me than to see Kawada and Shawn Michaels in the ring together. Um, but uh, that there is no, there are no clips of that match. Unfortunately, this is, that's one episode that's not on YouTube. Of course. <laughs> of course. Maybe it's out there somewhere in the ether. Uh, the only thing I'll say right here is I love Gary Hart. I always thought Gary Hart was a great manager. I think he's underrated. He has such a, a, a rhythm with how he talks. Yeah. And he was all, he always had the foreign heels. That was always what he, what he had. And um, I, I always was was a, a fan of, of, of Gary Hart's, you know, as, as a kid, I would say I love to hate Gary Hart. Um, right. But, you know, now I certainly have appreciation. I think he's he's an underrated, you know, manager. 
Yeah, I mean, and he was always known for, you know, managing foreign heels. Am I mm -hmm. right? Primarily, yeah. yeah. I mean, he was, and 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 usually he was the guy that, uh, uh, like, I remember in Florida, he had the great Muda. When Muda came over for his right. year tour that we were just talking about, that the that the Asian wrestlers would do. So you know, he had, and and he managed, um, I believe, in 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 uh, World Championship Wrestling, he had. The, uh, the he had the he was part of the JTEX Corporation. Uh, he, you know he had some Japanese guys and Terry Funk and you know a weird mix of dudes. But but he primarily had the foreign heels, and it was usually because they didn't speak English or they didn't speak English well enough. Or sometimes I think he managed maybe maybe managed Kamala for a while uh, too as well. You know the guys they didn't necessarily want to talk. You know, right. things like that, you know, is usually who Gary got. So, you know, a lot of, we talk about all these great managers like, you know, Bobby Heenan just got anybody, you know, Jimmy Hart just kind of got anybody. And, and, uh, you know, Gary Hart was very specific. He would get some other people. There's usually very specific, the type of wrestlers that he managed. And I think that gives him a very unique uh, d distinction and a, and a unique flavor uh, to him, maybe, maybe we can do a unstable, stable Gary Hart at some point. That would be fun. Yeah. Guys that Gary Hart managed a lot, a lot of foreign heels, a lot of foreign heels. Yeah, yeah, no, that would be a good idea. Um, and uh, yeah, so like this is uh, the end of what we see on YouTube as mm -hmm. this episode. And uh, you know, like I said, uh, Fred Barron would change the name to USA All-Star Wrestling so it would appear less regional. Um, but the issues ran much deeper than the name, obviously. Um, a lot of the people that you see here would go on to other promotions. Um, some would go to WCW. Um, you know, you would have Shawn Michaels go to AWA where, you know, he would hook up with Marty Jannetty and become the Midnight Rockers. Um, so, you know, like I said, at the beginning, uh, Texas wrestling was just kind of a mess at this point. And like this one was based mainly out of San Antonio. Um, so it, it is interesting. I, I do think though, if what I'm reading on some of these, you know, uh, forums is true, there is enough here for a dark side of the ring. <laughs> well, maybe we'll get that, they, you know, they're going to run out of topics eventually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm surprised they haven't done Buck Zumhoff yet. That would be a good one. That that is one that always surprised me that they haven't got. They to wanted to do gentleman Chris Adams um, for this season, I know, but that, like he's not on the list, so that's yeah. I, mm -hmm. I just recently watched. I'm trying to. I haven't. I'm not catching up. I recently did watch with uh, my wife the um, the one about the uh, Grizzly Smith and Jake Roberts and Sam Houston. Yeah. And all that, um, which she was very interested by. And you know what? I, I just met you to chat. I'm recording alone. My wife is not here today. When we get done here, I may go watch the XPW episode. I was very interested in that one. Okay. I think that's from last season, not the current season. All right. No. Yeah, that would be fun. Um, all right. Yeah. So eventually this promotion died out but it is interesting to look back on this and see an early Shawn michaels an early kawada um you know chavo classic being you know the top face um you know people probably don't know much about al madrill but uh there are some names here you know early typhoon he's just a you know he's just a passing storm at this point at this point Right. That that's an easy layup of a joke there. He, he he's not a shock master. He's a shock apprentice at this yeah. point. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Um, all right. So if you know anything about Texas All Star Wrestling, uh let us know what you think. And uh if you want to go watch this episode, as I've said, it is on YouTube. So feel free to check it out and let us know your thoughts. And uh check out our other episodes, segment surgery. Uh, stupid questions, random match reviews, uh, what's that card? And we are also wherever you listen to podcasts. So for Leonard, my name is Chad, and we will see you next time.